Lesson is a continuation, a lesson that we didn't get to do last week because of the snow and things. We want to make sure everybody got home safely. But tonight we're continuing our series of lessons on the seven I am statements of Christ, looking at how Christ says in John chapter 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. This evening we want to show how indeed Christ is the good shepherd. When you think about that phrase, the good shepherd, the word good implies there must be those who are not good shepherds. There must be those who are not right shepherds and godly shepherds. Whenever you have a word describing, or an adjective, I should say, describing another word, that means there are obviously those who are not a good shepherd. If you have a good shepherd, there must be bad ones or poor examples of shepherds. Would you agree today that people have or can have a wrong idea about a shepherd? If you look at John 10 and verse 11, Christ says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, as we're going to see, the sheep obviously must be those who are servants of God, followers of Christ. So he, a good shepherd is one who's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. That is also, we would say today, in New Testament times for the church. This must be the case when it comes to some of the confusion we see in the spiritual world, in the, in the world today, that we see those, in, especially in denominational backgrounds, who follow what they call a pastor, which is a different term for a shepherd, because you look in the New Testament, you find the elders are oftentimes referred to as not just elders, but also bishops, shepherds, overseers. And you find a similar idea in pastor in the Old Testament, but it is not the idea that we find commonly throughout the denominational world. So tonight we will look at what the Bible has to say about the good shepherd. And we think about shepherds, we must remember there are the good, the bad, and the phony. I was going to go with the good, the bad, and the ugly, but I thought the phony was a better way to describe some of their actions. Even though some of their actions and some of their ideas are indeed pretty ugly when you think about what they result in. But if you look at John chapter 7, or John chapter 10 rather, verses 7 through 8, we find we're going to do a comparison. The bad compared to the good, and then the phony compared to the good. And in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now you think about the idea how the sheep did not hear them. We talked about a moment ago how the sheep are the saved. The reason they are saved is because they did not hear those false teachers who went before Christ and existed during Christ's time and, of course, exist after his time as well. The thieves and robbers, they reference to false teachers. The sheep are those who follow Christ's teachings, thus they do not hear, that is, they do not obey these false teachings. And you think about what Christ says here in verse 7. He says, most assuredly, which means there is no doubt, there is no question. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, which means he is the door, you might say, for the sheep, the door which the sheep must pass through. He says, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. You think about that, how would you, you think about describing a false teacher, why would you use the term thieves and robbers? Well, isn't it true by, by following false teachings, by following false ideas, and by giving these false ideas out that you're robbing people of their, eternal, their chance of eternal life with God? Now, I think that's very easy to understand. By following false teachings, we're allowing ourselves to be robbed of the chance of eternal life. And Paul talks about such as well in the New Testament, that we do not lose our reward and not allow anyone to rob us of our reward through the idea of false hope and false teachings. So we see in verse 7 and 8, he says, All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep, that is the faithful, did not hear them. That is, they did not obey those things. That's why he can still refer to them as sheep. Because if someone gives in and starts falling after false doctrine, that leads them away from God, of course, that's why it's false, they're no longer one of the sheep. They have to be brought back into the fold. We hear that uh, terminology sometimes. Salvation is through Christ, that is the door, 
And in Christ, we find spiritual blessings. That is to say, pasture. Look at John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Christ again says, I am the door, singular. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and, in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is, you might paraphrase that in saying to, remo to rob people, to rob people of hope of eternal life. That's what these thieves, these robbers do. They steal, they kill, they destroy. He says, I have come that they might have life. That is, the they there being those who come to obedience to the, of the gospel through Christ. That they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Wouldn't you agree that life in heaven and life in hell is a difference between living a life that is abundant and living a life that is consumed in torments? To have a life that is more abundant would definitely include the idea of eternal life. Well, let's think about this. Christ says, He is the door. If anyone enters by me, He says, He will be saved. Now, if you're going to enter by Christ, obviously you must do what? You must abide and follow His teachings. Otherwise, you could not enter in. That's why these thieves and robbers are outside of Christ, because they have not obeyed Christ. He says he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now you think about this idea of finding pasture. The idea here is that Christ will, will what? Will give them spiritual blessings. You think about through this life, the idea of, of pasture, the idea is we can go through this life and knowing that Christ is with us, that Christ hears our prayers, that the Heavenly Father hears our prayers, it's Christ being our mediator, and thus we have those spiritual blessings. So that no matter where we go throughout life, we can find pasture, we can find comfort, and knowing that God and Christ are there with us. So salvation is through Christ, that is the door, and in Christ you find spiritual blessings. So in Christ, you could say, is the pasture where we find spiritual blessings. Well, let's continue on. We've seen the bad compared to the good. The bad rob people of their hope of eternal life. That's one of the things we have to help you understand that when you follow an idea that is contrary to the Bible, you have a chance of losing your eternal soul unless you repent of it, unless you turn from those things and obey the truth. So we've seen the bad compared to the good, but now let's look at the phony compared to the good. In John chapter 10, looking at verse 11 through verse 13, the Bible says, I am the good shepherd. Again, this is Christ speaking. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We might say the good shepherd gives it all. Now when we read the phrase, he gives his life for the sheep, we think, okay, he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. And of course, Christ did that. But also, he stood up for truth, didn't he? He rebuked false teachers. He rebuked the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees so many different times. They rebuked him. They, they hated Christ for doing that, but he did it every single time. The idea there, he gave everything to protecting the sheep. There's no good reason for anyone on the face of the planet, no matter what time they lived in, to lose their eternal soul in the place we call hell. Because Christ has given it all. Not just his, phys his physical life, but he gave it all. That is, protecting the, the, the faithful from false ideas and false teachings. So the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But now notice in verse, verse 12, it says, But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd... One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. You think about a picture in your mind for a second, if you would, a huge field filled with sheep. And you have a shepherd in the center, he's maybe up in something I think kind of like a deer stand almost, looking out over all the sheep. And then he has the lights up. He's watching as, a, as the sun goes down. He, he has the lights up, has on his flashlight. He's looking, watching for the sheep, watching the sheep. And then he sees a wolf jump the fence. And he just stays and watches. That's not a very good shepherd, is it? In fact, that's when you'd fire immediately and have replaced because he's not doing anything but watching. We see here in verse 12, he says, A hireling is he, is he who is not the shepherd. One who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. 
You know what happens sometimes when false teaching is introduced into a congregation, any congregation? You have those who stay and try to stand for what is right. You have those who are persuaded and follow false teaching. Then you also have the third group, those who just leave and go back maybe to a different group or maybe just back into the world in general. Because the confusion has discouraged them in such a way they're no longer interested in spiritual things. And when you think about this in verse 12 and verse 13, that's what's happening here. The wolf, you could say the false teacher, he comes in and leaves, he comes in and catches the sheep and he scatters them. Verse 13, the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. A hireling is someone who only is present to be paid. He doesn't actually do anything. Somebody who just shows up, they sit in their stand and they watch the sheep and the wolf comes, they leave because they're afraid. They're not going to do anything about it. The idea we see is very clear in verse 13. The hireling flees because he is a hireling, now notice, and does not care about the sheep. Does Christ, does Christ care about the sheep? Does he care about the church? Obviously so. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that he purchased the church with his own blood. Obviously he cares about the church and cares about its members. As we know, he shows that love on the cross. So the phony are the, are the hirelings who do not protect the sheep. Instead, they flee and allow the sheep to be scattered. If a hireling is a phony, sometimes someone we might call simply a fake, then, then when we read that the hireling flees because he is a hireling and doesn't care about the sheep, is because he is a phony that is a fake. That is, he's not a true shepherd. You know, just because so, someone puts on a uniform when they walk into a place of a business doesn't mean they're actually an employee, does it? You have those who, in every place you work, you have those group of, you have that maybe one person who comes in and they put on their, their, they put on their uniform, they put on their little name badge, or the case may be, and they, they come in, they sit down, and they do nothing. Maybe they do very little, just enough to get by. Well, that's the idea of a hireling. Someone who just does just enough to get that paycheck. Well, here when things get bad and the wolf comes in, the hireling just leaves. He is not a true shepherd. You can also think about this. The same might be said of elders who do not shepherd the flock of God. They allow false teachings to come in and do not stand for the truth. Or maybe instead they either do nothing, or maybe they follow the false teaching themselves, or maybe they just simply leave. Let's go to Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. It says, For a bishop, referring to an elder, now remember, an elder and a bishop are the same thing. When you see here talking about elders, you see the term elder or bishop or overseer or shepherd, it's all actually referring to the same office, the same person. They use different terms because it's just different ways to, you might be able to describe it. But it's all referring to the same office. It says, for a bishop, or you might say an elder, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick temper, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Now here is where we get to what we're talking about. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, now notice, by, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convict those who what? Who contradict. He's talking about having the knowledge, not just the willingness, but the knowledge to actually stand up and to defend the truth when those who come in who contradict the truth. He says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths, now notice, must be stopped who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Now some, now there's a lot of different ways you think about the way, think about dishonest gain. You think about mon, uh, materialistic gain, you think about money. But you ever think about this way, you think about why someone began spreading a false idea. Because people are more apt to believe a lie sometimes than you are to believe the truth. You tell someone that once you're saved, you're always saved. That they're going to like that better than you better remain faithful to God every day of your life and repent when you fail. Well, which one sounds easier? Well, this one, I do whatever I want. And this one, I better keep myself in line. 
So we have the reasons why. And of course the list goes on and on. But notice in verse 11 he says, Whose mouths must be stopped, referring to those who would lead away the sheep from the one true shepherd, which is, of course, Christ. So he's seen the shepherds compared to the, the, the good shepherd compared to the bad, the good shepherd compared to the phony. But let's also now look at what the good shepherd offers. You think about what the good shepherd offers, being Christ. What could Christ possibly offer us? Well, in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, we see he offers us protection from sin. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. How do we have protection from sin in Christ? That is that his blood, as we see here in verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep through Christ, laying down his life for us. We have the ability to have our sins washed away so we can gain eternal life. That's how we have protection from sin. You must have protection from the consequence of sin through the life or through the death, rather, of Christ on the cross. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, my sheep, in reference to those who are faithfully following him, and am known by my own, which means they know him, they're obedient. And as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life, for the sheep. For who? For the faithful. Because the faithful are those who get to take advantage of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Through the death of Christ on the cross, we can be reconciled to God and thereby find protection from sin and its price. Romans 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more have been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. How are we saved from sin? By the death of Christ on the cross, by the shedding of His blood. He says we shall be saved by His life. Only one person's life can save our own, the life of Christ. What else does a good shepherd offer? Well, he offers a family of believers, which I'll call, of course, the church. One of the greatest blessings of being a Christian is the church having faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who believe the same way you believe, for the same reason you believe. You hold to the Bible the same way you do because they want to do what is right. To have them by your side is one of the biggest blessings you can have in this life. And in John 10 and verse 16, the Bible says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. You know, denominational people have you believe that the other Sheep are denominations. And that's not what he's talking about at all. You look at this in context, he's never mentioned other groups. He's mentioning those who have yet to obey the gospel. That's all he's talking about. Because you can't have denominations when, it, when the denomination is not in existence. He could be talking about the Baptists or Luther or anyone else because they weren't even around yet. All he's talking about are those who have yet to obey the gospel. And other sheep I have which are none of this fold, those who have not obeyed, who may obey, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. Now notice how many flocks there are. There's only one. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. You ask some time, talk to some of your denominational friends and ask them about their denomination. Ask them just about their organization, how it's or if they know what is, how it's organized, because I'll be honest, a lot of people don't even know how their domination is organized. If you ask them, well, who oversees this congregation? They may tell you some convention. Some may say, well, I don't know. Well, we think about this. When we say who oversees our congregation, we say the Lord does. Because the Lord's ahead of the church, isn't he? We see in verse 16, he says, there will be one flock and one shepherd which, of course, is Christ. There were and still are those who may come to obey God. Those that do will be added to the flock, that is, the one flock, the church, and they will have one shepherd. To those who are not following the shepherd, what do we say to them? In John 10, verse 26 and 27, it says, But you do not believe... Because you are not of my sheep. As I have said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
if we're going to have a part in the flock that is the church, the one true shepherd overseas is the head of, we must be willing to obey Christ, be willing to obey God. Many do not believe because they are not actually seeking Christ, but their own way of doing things. You think about this, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. A lot of people today do not like sometimes to talk about the church of Christ because we're so much different from everyone else. Why? Because we read the Bible, silly us, we want to try to follow it and do only what it says. What, what is Christ offering us? Well, Christ, that is the shepherd of the obedient, offers, is, he offers us something no one else can. You see in verse, in John 27, I'm getting him myself, John, 20, John 10, 27, 28, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, they follow me. And I give them, who is the them? My sheep, eternal life, and they shall never perish, Neither shall anyone snatch it out of my hand. Of course, there's that verse where one says, There once your Savior always saved. Well, that's not anything at all, is it? What is he talking about? That once you're part of the body of Christ, as long as you're faithful to him, no one can forcibly pull you away from God. When we decide to leave God, it's because we decide we want to no longer faithfully follow him. He says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither should anyone snatch it out of my hand. No one can cause us to become unfaithful. They can only encourage us to and try to keep us away from God. But ultimately, it's up to us. It's not a verse concerning once saved, always saved. It's a verse saying that once we're following God, so long as we are faithfully following God, we can always be saved, so long as we are always following God. So the question becomes, are you following the shepherd of your soul. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but now but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. If we're going to have eternal life, we have to have Christ as our shepherd and as the overseer of our soul. We cannot allow anyone else to be in that position. This evening, as you think about these things, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, be willing to repent of your sins, confess Christ, be immersed in baptism as we see throughout the New Testament time and time again. And at the same time, you're, bapt you're placed into the body of Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. Who becomes the shepherd and overseer of our souls? Christ becomes the shepherd and overseer of our souls. So long as we remain faithful to Him. We know as Christians sometimes we can slip from the path but we can pick ourselves back up and get back on the path to eternal life. This evening, if you have any needs or concerns or prayer requests, you can come forward now. Ask that every stand and sing to encourage you.